The CNC is coming along, and I'm at the point now where I can draw some very boxy boxes. And that is pretty cool. But uh, this video isn't about the progress I've made lately. It's about correcting a few mistakes on the things I've already done. Because you see, the whole build here is largely going by the seat of my pants. And as I've gone and built it and learned and made these videos, I've realized I've also made a few mistakes. Now, back in the day, uh, YouTube had the option for creators to correct their videos after the fact, mostly by adding uh, closed caption annotations on the bottom. That must have been like 10 years ago, though, uh, uh, back when I had a channel for my personal training business, like a long, long time ago. And it seems like they've taken away that feature in the meanwhile. So when you see an annotation on one of my videos, that's something I caught in editing and wanted to comment on before I even published it. It appears the only way to make corrections now, after you publish the video, is to either put something in the description, like I've been trying to do, uh, do a follow-up video, like I'm doing right now, or publish something on an external web page, which I'm also working on slowly in the background. But all three of those things kind of rely on just hoping people see the updated content, which is far from ideal. It does look like a few people are tuning in to watch these videos, though, which is really cool. So if I either say anything here that's unclear or clearly wrong, or I forget to upload something I said I would, or make some sort of comment, uh, just drop me a line in the comments and I'll try to clarify. Anyway, here's a few things I want to revisit. First off, the table dimensions. As I've said before, I made this thing about as big as I can fit in my shop, and it's roughly 50 inches in this direction. Uh, the reason for that being that then I can fit the majority of a sheet of steel in the cutting area at one time, and that would simply be convenient. And if I wanted to do a whole sheet as one workpiece, I could theoretically do that by sliding it in this direction or this direction and indexing it in parts. Of course, silly me wouldn't made it 50 inches between here and here, which means it's only 46 on the inside. <sighs> And the only difference between that and having it fit a whole sheet in this direction would have been thinking through the numbers a bit more carefully to make these trusses and the y-axis a bit longer and drilling the holes in a slightly different spot. But, you know, it's not that big a deal. I don't plan on having many, if any, projects that actually use a full sheet for one workpiece. You know, that'd be uh, like doing custom signage or something like that. And if I have a job like that, I'll just cut a two inch strip off the side and then it will fit and be close enough, you know? Um, in fact, with this thing not fitting a whole sheet, there's a chance that it just might come back in the future and remove a truss and then cut the whole thing short to reclaim some shop space. But, you know, it doesn't matter, you live and learn. Back when I was squaring the table, you might remember me showing that there's a point when all four corners were coming in wider than this square. And that really confused me because for one, it shouldn't be possible. And secondly, the diagonal measurements of the table were pretty much the same. I think they're within like a, an eighth or a sixteenth of an inch. And if the diagonal measurements match, then your table should be square. But a few days after I published it, I remembered there's a trick for actually checking how square the square is. You just put it against a flat edge, scribe a line, flip it, and then scribe another line. And if the two lines uh, overlap perfectly, or at least parallel, then you know that the square is actually true. But uh, mine came in showing that the square is actually more like 89.5 degrees rather than 90, so that explains why there is some play in each of the four corners. To make these pulleys fit the motors, I ended up boring them out in a pretty hacky way. I already talked about this in an earlier video, where uh, I was caught off guard by how the motors are dual shaft, with a quarter inch up top and eight mils down below, but the mounting face is only on one side. So I used some sandpaper to bore the pulleys open, which I already knew was a bad idea. And now that I actually have them running, I can tell you there is some noticeable run out. But I'm hoping the error it transmits to the parts won't be that bad. Uh, you know, judging by the boxes I've already drawn, those came out pretty well. So I'll run this for a while, see how it goes. Uh, if it does end up being a noticeable source of error, then I checked online already and buying the right pulley is like 10 bucks a pop. That way it already have an 8mm bore and will fit, you know, just fine. It'll be an easy replacement. Though, again, <laughs> it's probably what I should have done in the first place. You're going to want these carriage rollers looser than I should before. 
Uh, when I first set them up, I had them uh, tightened down so I could still move the gantry back and forth by pushing with one finger, but it took a good amount of pressure. Uh, when it came to actually setting the belt up and tensioning that, I found that the gantry then just wouldn't move. Uh, there was too much resistance in the tension on the bearings and the tension of the belt that not even a pair of 400 something ounce inch motors could overcome it. So when you set these up, you don't want them wobbling, but you do want them to move pretty freely when you push with one finger. One thing I began doing pretty late in the game was adding access holes here for an Allen key. And that just makes it way faster to get these bolts mostly tightened up before we come in and do the final torque. Doing it the entire time this way is just, it's no fun. Uh, and I'd done that maybe two or three times before I got tired of it and thought like, oh, I just pop some more holes in here and save myself a lot of time. So, so far I've done it here and back there. And uh, next time I take these things apart, I'm gonna be doing it across from every belt tensioner and on that side as well. Uh, one other thing that might be helpful is uh, this little guy here, which is a small ratchet driver from Harbor Freight. It costs like three bucks or whatever. And it, you can get in these tight spaces pretty well. And there's also uh, this little thumb wheel here you can pop off. So it does uh, the hex bits on this end. If I can show you working with one hand, Blah. there we go. And there that goes off in the black hole. Great. <laughs> anyway, once you pop the thumb wheel off, you have a bit more clearance to work. And there's also a quarter inch drive here uh, for sockets. The sockets aren't that helpful working in uh, something this small because the size of the socket and uh, this little bit here kind of gets in the way. But uh, just having the thumb wheel off might give you some more room for helping you slide the hex bits in that way. While I was hooking all this up for testing, I was having some weird issues where not all the motors were firing at once. And at first I thought that was because of a bad Molex crimp. That ended up not being the case, but it did have me look at the spec sheet one more time where I noticed something I hadn't seen before. And that's that these Minifit Juniors are only rated for 30 cycles of plugging and unplugging. Now, what does that mean? It means that as you do each cycle, the plug gets kind of worn out and eventually doesn't make as good of a connection. Hmm. Does it mean it falls apart after number 30? No, <laughs> it just means it's not as good and you should apply some sort of derating. Now these plugs are already rated for, I think like twice the amperage you're putting through them. So there's already a good amount of leeway there. So I'm not too concerned about our application. And in fact, they were still very, very helpful to have while setting this up for testing and unplugging and replugging and unplugging several times as I was working through uh, all the wiring and stuff. So I would recommend having a plug here. Uh, I just thought it was worth pointing out that officially it's only ready for 30. Over here in this ungodly mess of wires, there's a few details I'm still trying to iron out. Uh, once I'd done the crimps on all my cables, I wanted to test them and make sure they're good. So I put Gerbil onto an Arduino Nano and began working on that. And then I found some kind of funny stuff. Now for those of you who aren't familiar, uh, Arduinos are simple, small, and inexpensive pieces of hardware that you can program for doing a single simple task, such as uh, reading G-code and making the pulses for your drivers. And that's what Gerbil does. So you put Gerbil on an Arduino, and then you have a basic CNC controller. Now the chips that run these guys are much more like what you'd find uh, in like an early 2000s MP3 player <laughs> or like the microwave oven in your kitchen. And they're much further from what you'd find than on a computer, uh, like running Linux CNC. So these guys are very low powered. They don't have all the bells and whistles that Linux CNC has, and I wouldn't call them a replacement, but for doing you know simple testing and stuff, they're great. Uh, it does take a bit more technical savvy to run in my opinion, but for, you know, quick and dirty, really hacky shit, Arduinos just can't be beat. Anyway, once I hooked these drivers up to the Arduino and began testing them, I found that they might only be capable of doing micro-stepping and can't do the full 200 steps per rev. Because a stepper motor usually has 200 steps built into it. That's the way it wants to step. But a micro-stepping driver can do some black magic that holds the motor at a fractional step in between its discrete steps. Uh, that gives you higher resolution, but then it has some drawbacks in terms of torque and stuff like that. And these one tie drivers that are shown in the other videos have a little table here on the side, and that tells you what combination of switches gives you what degree of micro stepping, whether it's 400, 800, 1600, up to 25,000 uh, or so micro steps per revolution. 
and there's one combination that they left off the chart. And I had assumed that that was for 200 steps per rev. You know, if you set them all that way, that you would have no micro-stepping and do full stepping instead. But once I actually tested it with the Arduino, that appeared to not be the case. And it seemed that it was just another setting for micro-stepping. Now, I didn't go back and triple check my work and make sure I didn't mess up something else in that setup. Uh, and then for me, it doesn't really matter because I intend to use micro-stepping and most builders probably will. But just be forewarned, if you want to use a DQ5 of 2 maze and you're planning on doing whole stepping at 200 steps per rev, then you might not be able to do that and you might need to find some other drivers. Next up, I had some other issues trying to tie together the two drivers for the x-axis. I had this set up, so it's Y across the gantry, X1, X2, moving the gantry, and then Z for up and down on the end here. And these wires going to the steppers are arranged uh, yellow, black, blue, and red, and then black, yellow, blue, and red on this one. And as I talked about in an earlier video, when you swap one pair of wires, that means for the same set of signals, these two drivers should move the motors in opposite directions, which is what I need to uh, actually move the gantry back and forth. So in theory, if I took the blue signal wires and the yellow signal wires from these two drivers and tied them together, I should be able to feed them off one pair of pins on the breakout board. And that should work, but it wasn't. So the exact same set of wires plugged in the Arduino would work. And if I plugged it back into the uh, breakout board then, it wouldn't. And I could even go as far as uh, unplugging one driver then and then testing it, and that would work plugging that wire back in that driver and unplugging the other one, and then that would work. So it, it seemed that uh, the pins couldn't provide enough juice to give a signal to both drivers at the same time. So I went online and looked into this and did find a couple of posts on the Linux CNC forums where one guy is taking an in-depth look at a similar breakout board. And I'll be totally honest, uh, when he began quoting different part numbers on like different opto-isolators and giving screenshots from his oscilloscope, he kind of lost me. That stuff, it just went over my head. <laughs> but the gist of it seemed to be that, yeah, if you draw too much current off the pins, then you can't get a signal to either of your drivers. Now, the Arduino just happened to provide enough power that it could feed both drivers, and the breakout board simply couldn't. So it seemed that if you pulled the jumpers that tie uh, one side of the opto-isolators to the other ones, then you could give this side of the board a higher voltage supply, and then that might fix your problem. So here I'm just feeding it off the five volt power supply down there. If you fed the uh, plus five and ground here with five volts the way you're supposed to, and then pull these jumpers and feed these ones with something slightly higher, then you can get enough current to feed both your drivers. Um, I don't have any other power supplies though to test that with, and I'm not sure what the maximum voltage you could apply to the other side of the opto isolators would be. So what I'm doing instead is simply using a second set of pins. Now, if you had the same problem and you decide to solve it the way I did by just using a leftover set of output pins, I gotta warn you about one thing in the Linux CNC setup. Uh, early on in the StepConf wizard, you pick which pin does what. So you pick one pin for the spindle or the torch, uh, you pick another two pins for your X, you know, both the pulse and the direction, uh, two for your Y, two for your Z, and you pick two more for your X. And that basically clones the X output to both sets of output pins so you can run both drivers. So far, so good. What will get you is a few pages later when you set the, uh, the lead pitch and the velocity and the acceleration for that axis. The test this axis tool where you jog the motor back and forth does not account for the cloned output. The full CNC controller does, but the test this axis tool is written rather simply and does not account for that output so only one motor will run. Now this is a known limitation of the tool, but it's not one that I personally know. Uh, so I ended up wasting a good bit of time wondering what the hell was going on before I you know, went online and looked into it and found out like, okay, this is a known problem. Um, so I didn't know, now you know, okay? So if you're testing this thing on an assembled machine, especially, you know, one that uh, actually needs both, motor, both motors to run, otherwise it crashes, just watch out for that, okay? Be careful. The, uh, the test this axis tool is most certainly just for basic testing. And last but not least, I found it. Focus, you fuck.